So last night I was, you know, the, the day before also, it was looking at this and looking at participants and other speakers. So there was this, which was the, the what? The date, well the date is right oh. okay. because the slides are stale. <laughs> <laughs> and, and we have a bunch of results that flesh this out and we're, we're writing up a boiling the ocean sort of monograph on random matrix theory for machine learning. And I gave a talk about a year ago today saying that this is just you know, a month or two away from being finished. So I'll say that this is a month or two away from being finished because it still is. Sometimes when you boil the ocean it takes a little bit of time. So uh, w once that's of course finished, it's easy. You have the whole thing. You get a new deck of slides and so on. So the slides are a little stale. So the question is, do I go through this and describe basically the basic idea, or do I bait and switch and swap to something that's sort of morally the same, that will touch a lot of what people here probably know about in terms of statistics and, and neural networks and so on, that really grew out of this, but, but it, it's not immediately obvious from that slide deck how it ties back to random matrix theory, but it does. So I figured I'll, I'll start with this. And you can view this as a preamble rant. And then I'll swap over to the other thing um, and, and just realize the two connect together under the hood. And I'll try and point out how that's the case. <clears throat> so the rant will start by saying, what is random matrix theory? So I've done a lot of work on randomized linear algebra and, and computational statistics. I, I sort of don't know what random, OK, so this isn't quite true. A few years ago, I didn't really know what random matrix theory was. When you Google searched 15 years ago, random, MA, or random, it would autocomplete to random matrix theory. Now it completes to like randomized linear algebra or something. So this is a sign of success, I guess, because you know, now, now that's, that's well known enough. And, and the, the, the surprising thing is that for all the work we did in randomized linear algebra, you needed almost no random matrix theory. Um, we did stuff early on that needed matrix concentration, and that needed um, entropy concentration and, and other stuff that was very fine grained. But then 2010 or so, a lot of the stuff was black boxed. Um, winter, I mean, a bunch of people had results that you could more or less black box into matrix churn off bounds. Um, there's an asymptotic versus not issue, which will be sort of under the hood in what I'll be talking about. And so once you have that, just black box that, and it's all just linear algebra feed through that. And you feed through something called the subspace embedding, which is the Euclidean version of, of, of Johnson Linden stress. So you, need no, you basically need no random matrix theory, and so you can march on. So, um, I mean, that's either good or bad. It means you don't need to know random matrix theory, which for some people is a big lift to do some randomized linear algebra. But it means that a lot of the ideas get sort of removed. It also means that um, there's, if you feed everything through matrix Chernoff bounds, um, you might say, you know, um, and Johnson Lindenstrauss sort of ideas, you might say, you know, you could do better. I mean, there's, there's going to be a bit of a gap there. I mean, you know, it's, it's going to be overkill. It's overkill in a worst case sense in some cases. But it's also overkill when you use that result in pipelines. The simplest pipeline is I want to take a, uh, a, a, a precondition or I want to iterate it, conjugate gradient. So that's just a basic linear algebraic pipeline. I want to feed it into a convex optimization pipeline. I want to feed it into atom and neural network training with 57 moving parts and generate BERT or something. That's a pipeline, right? And so um, sometimes it's good to lose rank and not be a subspace embedding and violate Johnson Lindenstrauss. Why? Precisely because you get a little bit of bias variance trade-off. And so there's a trade. And then if you're talking to GPUs, and this term maps better GPUs than that term. I mean, so it's a very complicated situation. So, <clears throat> um, so there's going to be a few technical things, and I'll allude to here, and then I'll swap over to the other side deck. But practice theory and theorems. So random matrix theory is interesting because I think people think about it in very different ways. Right? So you can be a mathematician, and the first approximation, I think, the only place to live is a Gaussian universality class. So you start there and you relax for a moment results and you get results typically on eigenvalues because you go through a steel twist transform, right? Um, there's a bunch of stuff that depends on eigenvalues and that's good. But you could say, you know, why did you start from Gaussian universality as, as opposed to what else you're going to do, right? Um, ask how random matrix theory started. I mean, there was either Wishart or Wigner. And, um, this is an interesting disconnect because this was back when statistics in like 1920, before it had sort of instantiated into the sort of semi-mathematical thing it is. I mean, how does statistics touch data versus ML touch data is sort of a question here. Because how these methods are used in neural network training gets exactly to that issue. So think about how Wigner used random matrix theory. So Wigner was a nuclear physicist. You could solve a hydrogen atom. You couldn't go to helium. You could solve two bodies by reducing it to one. You couldn't go to three. So how are you going to deal with a nucleus with you know, 200 atoms, never mind you know, whatever with 50 gazillion atoms, right? 10 to the 23 atoms. So what he said was, I'm interested in the low-lying states. 
I'm going to model all this stuff as ignorance, and I'm going to try and understand low-lying states. And, and, and so I'm going to treat this as essentially a bunch of random junk with some stuff going on here. And I'm going to want to know how these things talk to each other. And they do matrix perturbation theory, or quantum mechanical perturbation theory, to, to look at you know, first and second order terms that talk to the bulk. So this is not random. There's a lot of structure going on here, right? But you treat it as, as ignorance, as, as random, and then maybe with perturbative corrections. So there's no theorems here. You can't prove these perturbation series converge, and there's no theorems here. Um, but, but this theory, and so the word theory, when you do random matrix theory instantiated as mathematicians, or statistical learning theory instantiated in statistics departments or, or theoretical computer science, basically is a bunch of theorems. You have sufficient conditions. They're typically not falsifiable or checkable in, in a scientific sense, and you derive something, oftentimes bounds. And we'll get to that later. Um, in science, theory means something very different. So physics uses random matrix theory and all sorts of other stuff basically to compute numbers. Right? They'll cheat anywhere, sigma field, Dirac delta, and they'll cheat anywhere they can to get numbers. And then they measure the numbers against the world in falsifiable experiments, and they make their claims that way. So this is a very different way one could think about or use random matrix theory. I think this gets to the heart of random matrix theory. What's the title of the workshop? Random matrix theory for neural network training, whatever the exact title of the, this workshop is. <laughs> because random matrix theory, as you know, is a great area. It's, it's very elegant mathematics, and it's very widely useful. And people have used it in all sorts of different areas. And so in the last you know, five or ten years, machine learners have discovered it. And so now you can use it in machine learning. But what does it mean to use? One could be I have a bunch of theorems I want to present, statistical learning theorems, convergence rate theorems, you know, whatever. And I, and I feed these Gaussian universality. Um, um, with matrix Chernoff or, or marchenko Pasteur, whatever, into that sort of structure and get some results. They may not be falsifiable, but it's a theory in the sense of statistical learning theory. Another way is to say I'm going to look at the data, a la what um, Wigner did, and I'm going to say, what does it look like? Maybe it looks like the nucleus, maybe it doesn't. I'm going to derive something and I'm going to use it. Um, and I'm going to use it to make predictions, not to prove a theorem. So, th and, and, um, so what I want to talk about is a little bit of practice. Wh what do the data actually look like? So let's look at the nucleus and say, I mean, what does it look like? Because people have used random matrix theory not just for nuclei, but for protein structure, for a lot of other things. And protein structure is wildly not random in, in very interesting ways, actually. Um, so what do the data look like? So why are we doing this? Is this a, at all a plausible assumption? Then come up with a theory, and I'll, and I'll have a little bit to say about this, but this is going to be part of the preamble rant, and I'll get to some of this stuff. But you, know, you can use this to come up with a phenomenology and, and, and a theory in a, in a scientifically falsifiable sense. Now, um, one, if you like math. Two, if you realize how this fits into the texture of machine learning and a particular neural network training, you've got to put theorems there. So the, you know, for better or for worse, maybe and or for worse, um, a, a sort of modality in, in machine learning is to have a bunch of math to impress people and then some results. There's oftentimes a pretty strong disconnect between the two. So um, I think part of that's just by design. Machine learning is an engineering thing. You could say, this is the way the world should be, so I'm going to force you to do it this way. So it's not a scientific thing in that way. Um, this is driving things forward. And then you can distill out maybe what's going on under the hood in terms of um, why the methods actually work. All right, so this is sort of the way we're going to think about this. So in order to deliver on that, you've got to have theorems. Just, just the 99% of people want theorems, and it, it's, it's the way they think about things. Most of the people in machine learning are not trained as theoretical physicists that would know these perturbation expansions. They're trained in computer science and statistics, where theory means is other things. So this is sort of the heart of sort of what we're talking about. So, OK, so practice, theory more practice. I'll say what the key technical things are. I'll probably show you one slide here and then swap over. because. Um, if you know random matrix theory, that, that one slide will probably be enough, and you'll see through it. And you can imagine that there's 150 pages behind it. And if not, it's just believe the hand waving. All right, so um, <clears throat> look at the data. We could look at various things. Let's look at neural networks. So um, back in, I guess, 2017, there was only a, you know, a dozen or so neural networks that were publicly available. And by neural network, I mean I want to ask, I want to look at the data and make some claim about it, and um, in order to form a basis for this theory and theorems. And um, if I train the data, it's easy to cheat, right? Because there's a selection bias. I got to get the paper published, so I got to find a positive result there. Um, I probably want to use Gaussian universality class. I'm probably going to fiddle with parameters so it looks like that. So um, one form you could take is I want to 
view this as an observational experiment in the world, and I want to take what other people have done, and I want to ask falsifiable questions of that. So if that's the case, I can't work on ChatGPT unless OpenAI is going to share with me all their data and all their compute to reproduce that. I just can't because I'm not doing something falsifiable. Right? So you could try and ask falsifiable questions of that like a social scientist, but leave that aside. <clears throat> what I'm going to do is I want to take a model that I can chew on. So when I say <clears throat> models, what I want to do is download the weights and the structures and the architecture, but I don't know the data you used. I don't know the hyperparameters you used. I don't know whatever. And I want to do that to ask a falsifiable question. Right? So <clears throat> back then there was you know, a couple dozen. We started this work, Charles Martin and I, and um, they were all sort of small CV and AlexNet type things. You know, two years later, there was hundreds. Now there's thousands. Well, a couple of years later, there's thousands. Now there's probably, I don't know, 100,000 maybe. Um, <coughs> a lot of work, especially if you train it, is going to be a bad model. It's a toy model because you don't have the compute because you're at a university, right? So um, don't do that. Use state-of-the-art models. So worst case theory is consistent with a theory for bad models, which is fine. But if you want a theory for state-of-the-art things, just realize they may be different. And now people say, yeah, obviously, because the scaling laws and small might be different than big. But so, so if you do, don't be surprised if the low-quality results are different than the high-quality results. And we'll see that. Um, and don't train models. Work with pre-trained models precisely for the reason I, I just sort of said. OK. <clears throat> yeah? So I mean, the way the computer is working, though, we can really, in an academic setting, get to state-of-the-art for even like 2016, 2017, which is admittedly not for anybody. Yeah. But, I mean, as far as like developing a theory for deep learning, it would be surprising if you know we could actually you know train models at the 2017 level, get insights, you could. and it wouldn't generalize. And yeah, yeah. Some capacity, you know? Yeah. So the slides are a little bit old. Yeah, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I think if you were extremely careful methodologically and honest about the whole pipeline of results, you could work on the models 2017 with the university level compute now. Um, but you'd be the one person. There'd be a thousand people not doing that. So as, as a cultural matter, that's true. But you could. So I think if you took the ideas that I'm talking about here, you know, a range of other things, you could try and get the whole pipeline, and you could do that. Yeah. <clears throat> but it's an uphill battle. And part of the thing is you'll be talking to people who like certain things, theorems, and you want the, I mean, but yeah, you're right. All right, so here's a 10,000 foot view. So um, let's look at the eigenvalues. Why? Because still, just we're doing a random matrix here, so you got to like eigenvalues. Um, eigenvalues are sort of subtle things, actually. You know, they're not column norms and row norms. They get spectral structure. They get a correlations. So um, take whatever this is called. Um, what's the digit data set? MNIST. And train it to 99.9 or .9, whatever percent accuracy. Yeah, I don't know if it's two layer MLP or whatever. And look at the eigenvalues of the covariance matrix. It's a correlation matrix. Empirical fact, it's mean zero. Not obvious, but it is. So I'll use the two terms interchangeably. This is what the eigenvalues look like. A bump, bump there, and then a bunch of things that stick out. Empirical fact. Don't interpret just that's what it is. Now you can ask yourself, what does this mean? But to, to oversimplify everything before 2013, 2013 was this inflection point with uh, AlexNet and ImageNet and stuff. So everything prior to that looks like this, to oversimplify, right? <clears throat> so we'll interpret this in a minute. But <clears throat> All right. Post-2013, there was dozens, hundreds, thousands, now hundreds, thousand. Everything looks like this. So AlexNet. And, and, and that red, by the way, is the best MP fit. It's hard to automate it so by, by hand, but yeah. Um, so here's the best thing. So the question is, is this sort of like random, so you can use random matrix theory, or is this not? Ditto over there. And if you look at it and sort of squint, you know, it doesn't look too bad, right? There's just a bunch of stuff here. And a bit of stuff there, that's not too bad. Just call it low rank, right? So it's sort of like random matrix theory, right? So the, the whole ball game boils down to this. And you know, sort of everything looks like this, so it, as, as a you know, quote. All right. So does this look like random? OK, so if you've ever taught a class, you know the way is to ask a question. And then the audience says, obviously, well, no. OK, so then I'll explain why. So <clears throat> this is a little bit like if you were to flip a fair coin 1,000 times and see 800 heads. I mean, nowhere even close to random. Nowhere even close to Gaussian universality equals. Nowhere even close to that. We're on a linear, linear scale. So the subtlety in this tale is totally hidden from you. Just realize that, right? <clears throat> There's a massive, massive amount of mass missing from that, right? <clears throat> the bulk edge 
sort of sharp there with a few things. Is that Tracy Whittem? Is they, I don't know. But <clears throat> I mean, that's nothing even like that, right? This is whatever, con, uh, convex. It's, there's a huge amount of mass. It's convex, so there's correlation. So <clears throat> nothing even close to that. And you work a lot harder. This, the eigenvalues are heavy-tailed. Weights are mean zero, Gaussian-like, a bunch of three, four, five sigma events. So they're not Gaussian, but they're sort of Gaussian with some outliers. Eigenvalues are heavy-tailed. Power law, truncated power law, big complicated space. So the leading order thing is everything before 2013 looks like this. Oops, not that. <coughs> and this is a bulk plus spike model. This is what a statistician would call bulk plus spike. There's 10 eigenvalues that are large, the rest is junk. There might be information there. In fact, if you only keep the top 10 eigenvalues, you get 96% accuracy, not 99.9. .9. So there is stuff there. But as a modeling assumption, it's bulk plus spike. But that's a modeling assumption. This is an empirical fact. Right, so you can tell a Wigner story. Um, you can tell a Wishart story. But this is an empirical fact. And, and the way a statistician would think about it as well as a bulk plus spike. <clears throat> this is not that. Now, you could assume that, but you can assume anything you want. You could say this is a bulk and you miss some stuff. It's, it's a horribly bad assumption, but you could do that. You could say this is a bunch of spikes and do a low rank thing. And low rank's great, right? You, I mean, if you're going to keep 10 eigenvectors, you keep those 10, not those 10. But that doesn't mean it's at all good. So this is not a bulk plus spike. This is really a heavy-tailed set of eigenvalues. So you have a Gaussian ellipsoid, because I said the entry-wise, it's IID. And entry-wise, it looks sort of Gaussian-like with some five and you know, three sigma events. But the eigenvalue structure means that ellipsoid has a heavy, you know, a heavy tail set over its, its long axes. All right, empirical fact. Build out a theory, Wigner semicircle, Marchenko, you know, Wigner semicircle says so there's a semicircle. There's some subtleties at the edge. We spent, you know, a long time figuring out this, and then it's, it, it was clear that the effect you're looking for is 10x larger than that. But is those little blips near the edge, you know, Tracy Whittem or not? And it's not even close. So the, you know, random matrix theory 101 is you get your semicircle and your big, you, know, you get your edge. Um, if you're not square, I don't know if I pulled that slide. Yeah, if you're not square. Um, it's the same thing. It's, it's Marchenko Pasteur. You get a different shape, some stuff at the edge. The, as the shape depends on the aspect ratio and some things, a bunch of subtlety there. Um, <clears throat> so you can have basic Marchenko Pasteur where you're Gaussian, spiked covariance, which is really just the same thing. It's Gaussian with some low rank stuff. <clears throat> There's a complicated space in terms of heavy tailed random matrix theory. The easiest way to get heavy tails on eigenvalues is to have heavy tails on elements. Theorem you have heavy tails on elements, you get heavy tails on eigenvalues under the sort of usual assumption. Much, much, much harder to get heavy tails on eigenvalues if you don't have heavy tails on elements. Why? I mean, how are you going to get it? Eigenvalues about correlations, and you've got to put correlations in. So it means this element and this element, they all have to be same scale, but build in correlations. It shouldn't be surprising, actually, that um, that, that might be the case for a trained neural network. I mean, if you, if you look at the weights at the beginning of training, what do you think they are? I mean, you can start with anything you want, but everyone starts with a random matrix. So of course, they, they follow random matrix theory. Right, glow rod or whoever is, whatever is popular now. Right, so after tr the first step of training, you've done backprop. You've coupled in a bunch of correlations, and if you do backprop for ten epochs or however long you do it, huge range of correlations actually. Um, so it shouldn't be surprised that you've cooked correlations in. So here you're going to be using heavy-tailed random matrix theory, not because you think things are IID random in heavy-tailed sense. They're not, because you're modeling your ignorance analogously to how v Vign uh, Vichart would, Vigner would do it. Except here you have strong correlations over what's going on. It's not like you have a nucleus and you, and you say it's, it's IID Gaussian random. It's more like um, you have correlations in there which manifest themselves in a heavy-tailed way. The best analogy I can think of is a uh, protein, actually. So protein is just you know, a random walk. Well, you can't have the side chain stepping on it, so it's a self-avoiding random walk. Um, well, it's not a self-avoiding random walk because there's alpha helices. So, you know, so it's, it's, so, so people have done this sort of analysis on proteins. It's not good enough to get chemical accuracy, so biologists don't like it, but you can think about it this way. And then you can ask the question, what's the difference between a random heteropolymer? You can go to the lab across the street or wherever the biology department is, build a random heteropolymer of length 1,000, and a protein. By protein, I mean something in your body or an E. coli that's been engineered by evolution. And a random heteropolymer, you heat it up and cool it down 1,000 times, a million times, a trillion times, you'll never get the same state. You'll get a blob. A protein, you heat it up and cool it down here, you always get the same folded state. There's long range, short range, medium range, long range correlations that are built into that. So the best analogy, analogy I can think of for the neural network training is that you cook in those correlations. Those correlations don't manifest themselves in the elements. 
they manifest themselves in the correlations. So how do you deal with that? That's the, the leading order question here in terms of random matrix theory. So you can look at, <clears throat> um, here's, here's a theory based on that phenomenology. You can have a couple end states of training. One is random, it could be the case. One is random with some stuff sticking out. This is Lynette 5 on MNIST. One is heavy tailed, which is hard to see on a, on a linear linear axis. There's a transition between those two. We get Tracy Whittem effects as a transition between those two, and there's some degenerate things. So you can develop this, and you can use this as a phenomenology to make predictions. And then you can use ideas in the statistical mechanics of learning to build this out. So you can do a bunch of things with it. And, um, <clears throat> and I think I have it here. So um, what, what can you build out? So we're working on weight matrices. I want to chew on them as much as possible and be ignorant about how you train the data, the, the data you use, the training protocols. If you don't believe anything I say, pip install Weight Watcher and, and prove me wrong or prove me right. But if you prove me wrong, it's better than what most people are doing now, which is not even asking falsifiable questions. So you download this and, <clears throat> and, and see what you can do. So how do you want to use the theory? We're not going to be at the theorems yet. How do you want to use the theory? You could use it to perform diagnostics. You can look at leverage scores or um, residual error plots or whatever you learn in a regression diagnostic class. You could use it to make predictions about model quality, generalization. When I swap the slide deck, I'll talk about generalization. You could do post training modifications. You know, I, I want to have a model that's, that's robust to um, you know, people polluting the data and a range of things you know, that are of interest in security and whatever. Um, do post training. Practical question I have a million dollars. Um, this is a math meeting, so this is a hypothesis, but <laughs> I have a million dollars. Um, should, how should I use it? Should I use it to buy more machines, because GPUs are expensive, or more people, students, postdocs, engineers, employees, whatever, or more data? And that's a very practical question people face, companies face, you know, scientists face. Scientists don't frame it this way, companies do. but. Where should I spend that? There's no way to answer that question. There's no general methodology to answer that because you don't know how to evaluate how 2x or 10x more data would perform. There's a million heuristics, but there's no real way to validate. You know, I don't have an infrastructure of theory that says you know, my understanding of the parts of the model are analogous to what it would be in biology, where I would say I, I know that sort of I'm at the limit versus I know that I could absorb 10x more data. <clears throat> will training, of course, everyone wants to train, so will training longer help? Um, you might want to quantize and distill because you're hitting a memory wall, and so, and so you quantize to very low bits, and now you have other robustness issues. Everyone wants to construct regularized for training, so you could do that. But there's a lot more interesting things you could do. <clears throat> so I'll give you one example, and then. So one example is um, oh, I don't have my nice pretty picture, so me all. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> <clears throat> So the title here is Predicting Trends in the Quality of State-of-the-Art Neural Networks Without Access to Training Data or Testing Data. So question, can I take this approach and can I predict the quality of state-of-the-art models? And by that I don't mean MNIST, I mean whatever was state-of-the-art in 2021, but state-of-the-art now. And, um, and the short answer is going to be yes. Now there's a difference between generalization and model quality. So this is, a, this is an observational experiment. People put data out, and they say how good the model is. There's selection bias, there's observational, you know, but think of it like a social sociology experiment or, or uh, an astronomy experiment where you, you measure the stars, but you, know, the, you can only see stuff you know, not through the infrared because water absorbs in the infrared. So you're making ex, you know, observational measurements. And so I can't see the data you used. I can't see the hyperparameters you used, but I want to chew on the models. And I want to predict trends in model quality. This model is better than that model. So you can imagine that's useful for a range of things. And I think if ML machine learning is going to become sort of used at, I'll say, industrial scale, but not necessarily in industry. It could be in university and academic scientific contests where I train a model, someone validates a model, someone uses a model in, in, in a whole you know, pipeline. You need to answer a question like this. Otherwise, someone's got to own the whole pipeline. I mean, this is how drug, drugs are designed. You do this, you certify something. You do that, you certify something. You do this, you certify something. So you've got to be able to answer a question like that. And the short answer is yes. So you can't see all these slides, but um, I mean, all, all the figures. But um, you can predict trends in model quality just looking at this. Now, is it the case that I can give you a table of numbers and my number's big and bold at the bottom and always better, sort of what you want in the common task framework that machine learning does? And the answer is no. State-of-the-art models are oftentimes better, but you get a, a model that's 10x bigger that's the selection function is industrial forcing functions in terms of when they release it, that model might actually be undertrained because they wanted to push it out. 
And so um, some early stuff here on the, well, I guess on the next slide, on the GPT series, you know, the first version did well. The second version, I mean, the GPT series actually, it, it, the early versions it introduced, it had, it was a nice um, natural experiment of this because they had a version that they originally designed to be suboptimal, if you, if you recall, right? They released this, they said, this is too incredible, we can't release it, so we're releasing this thing designed to be suboptimal. Then six months later, they said, well, yeah, okay, we're fine. We'll release the better designed one. So you can see the early version, the next version that was designed to be suboptimal, which is, a, which is typically not the way models get out the door. Then you could look at one that is designed to be suboptimal, and naively, the theory fails. But if you understand that this was designed to be suboptimal and this one wasn't, you know, it, it actually does well. So this is using random matrix theory. Um, <clears throat> okay, so you can use it for a bunch of other things in terms of diagnostics, and if anyone's interested in that, you know, talk to me offline. So I want to put this slide up as, as how to develop a random matrix theory and swap over to a different, different use of this. So um, there's two things here that, that I think when, when the dust settles um, are relevant for random matrix theory qua random matrix theory. One is um, <clears throat> the data has this heavy-tailed structure, and so having something that meaningfully talks to that um, is important. The other thing is you're not in a common limit, which is fix everything and let one parameter diverge. Um, you fail to see lots of things when that's the case, right? You get subspace embeddings and Johnson Linus trust, et cetera, but that's, you know, m the aspect ratio of those matrices under underlying that theory are 1,000 by 4,000 or 100 by 300. I mean, they're, they're three. So you're really um, in what they call the proportional limit. Now, Marchenko Pasteur handles that, but um, ML people don't like limits. They want non asymptotic results. So, can you develop non asymptotic random matrix theory in the proportional limit that talks to that heavy tail structure? Or not, depending on the data you have. But, so, um, <clears throat> and, and I think in the proportional limit requires a big change of in, intuition, um, basically because if, if I have two classes, you know, I'm doing just forget about the neural network, clustering into two classes. Um, Intradistance in class A has one distribution. Intradistance in class B has one distribution. Interdistance has exactly the same distribution. But you can use an eigenvector, which has all these subtle correlations cooked in them to pull them apart. Right? So a lot of pairwise information, k nearest neighbors, that will just simply not hold there. All right? Now, there's a lot of models that have nonlinearities built in. You can ask, what effect does that have? And you should think of that as getting a leading order nonlinearity. If you're in an LLN limit, a law of large numbers limit, or a central limit theorem limit, the way you deal with that nonlinearity is, is, is a little bit, well, is a lot different. But um, think of it, you, you're going to deal with a nonlinearity, a little bit like a Taylor expansion, but especially in the CLT limit, it'll be different. Um, those nonlinearities typically are non universal. And then you're back to random matrix theory. Um, and then you deal with the Gaussian versus non-Gaussian universality class stuff. Um, you th typically think of spikes that pulled out as due to signal. Because of that nonlinearity, you can get spikes due just to the structure of the model. You put a log loss in there, and, and you look at it. And depending on the parameters, you can have a distribution. You can have a spike here, and you can have a spike here in the presence of pure noise. So the spike is due to the structure of the loss, the structure of the nonlinearity that you're feeding through, and having that as a leading order nonlinearity on the linear random matrix theory. So big, rich, complicated space there in terms of how you'd actually apply these ideas. Um, but I think that can be applied. It's just you know, pe people haven't quite done that yet. So linear models, low rank approximation, regression, high dimensions, this is different from the smaller counterparts. Um, people think about kernels and light kernels, and they're a good hydrogen atom or a good you know, drosophila or whatever to, to think about these things. Um, but it's also important to sort of understand where they break down, and this nonlinearity piece is one of the places they break down. So classical random matrix theory oftentimes focuses on eigenvalues. Machine learning applications typically need eigenvectors and, and other sorts of complex functionals. That's relevant because what makes a lot of classical random matrix theory work? Um, it took me a while because basically page one, chapter one, paragraph one, here's a steel to transform, do stuff for lots of pages, right? So why are you doing this? You're doing the Steele-Tis transform because you're working with a resolvent and you want a scalar functional. Especially when you're in the proportional regime, you don't have enough concentration for things to converge. So I have a matrix, a resolvent, that has not converged in a meaningful sense. But if you promise to query it with scalar function queries, you have converged in that sense. So th think of that as a weaker notion of convergence, right? So 
you have like an LLN and a CLT. This is a weaker notion of convergence. So the actual object hasn't, but when you query it in certain ways. So the Steelchase transform you can apply in the non-proportional limit or the proportional limit, but think of it in the proportional limit. Um, and, and you get eigenvalues out of popping out of the Steelchase transform. You could ask other scalar functionals, and other scalar functionals then the trace will give you eigenvalues and eigenvectors. It'll give you inverses and bilinear forms, integration and differentiation. A lot of ML depends on this because it's way, way overkill to say I want to classify. And theorem, if I have a big eigenvalue gap, something's good, and then I can classify. Right? You don't have that eigenvalue gap. You don't have that pairwise distance. The eigenvectors can still pull information out. And this is even just in kernels and special cases, never mind graphed on all the leading nonlinearities non and stuff. So work with the resolvent directly. Work with potentially other scalar functionals than that. Work in the proportional limit and work in the um, <clears throat> non-asymptotic case. So I think any subset of those that you think about moves you in the direction of, of making this, having theorems that will feed back and be practical in terms of how they'd be used. So let me pause there before I swap, swap over. Um, <clears throat> I thought that was going to be about 20 minutes. It was a little longer. But I can swap over now. But let me pause for a second to see if anyone has um, any questions on that. <laughs> Sometimes the um, uh, extra spikes that you get can be obtained from the structure of the noise. Both. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so, so yeah, so this, this is a, like a, I mean, it could be signal. It could be stuff going on in the noise, and then what counts as noise, and structure of the noise, and yeah. signal. And it could be just purely from the loss. And when it's purely from the loss, it's because you have a linear model, you feed it through some nonlinearity, and the nonlinearity, um, in, in, the, in the law of large numbers, the limit it really is a sort of a Taylor expansion because you've concentrated so strongly. In a central limit theorem sort of limit, um, you've got to deal with Hermy polynomials and a bunch of other stuff. So, so you, could have an, you could have the nonlinearity popping out for that, and it could be just from noise. It could be just from signal. So this is an interesting thing about if it's, if it's buried inside the structure of the noise, which is actually not something I think that machine learning and statistic learning theory techniques handle particularly well. But it's sort of, if, if, I know, if, it's, if I know what you're alluding to, I mean, it's a little bit like the way Wigner would deal with the low-lying eigenvalues when he was doing quantum mechanics. I mean, there's signal down here. I want to talk about what's going on down here. I can say something about what's going on down here, but I, that's just a leading order thing. I can do better. ML wants to do variational approximations and stuff because they want to balance something. But I, I can do a better job here if I want to make a numerical prediction by doing a first order or second order Taylor expansion. What that means is I have these eigenvalues. I have this eigenvalue talk to this eigenvalue, not directly. That's a leading order. I have this eigenvalue talk to this eigenvalue via uh, all of these. And you get a weaker effect. It's lower order, but, but the structure inside the noise. Yeah, yeah. And, I, and that's not something the ML techniques handle particularly well. But if, if there's random matrix ones that are particularly good for that, let me know. I don't know. Yeah. Just to follow up, one of the things <clears throat> that um, I've been looking at with my, my staff is a finite precision. Right, especially in these incredibly large models. We ran into like some problems where I couldn't understand what was going on with some, some of the ranks of the tangent spaces, and then we tried to model it, right? And you know, you, you, you're talking about these state of the arts, and we looked at the GPTs and looked at, it's like 800 billion parameters, 2.3 teraflops for, per forward pass, yeah. and they're training at mixed 8, 16 precision. Yeah. And you go to the NVIDIA pages, it's like, it's like trust us, yeah. it's fine. And so how, how do we, I don't think anyone's really looked at that at all. No. How, do, how would you recommend some of your um, metrics account for that? Um, well, if there's any NSF program managers listening online, what I'd recommend is that you fund a big effort on figuring out numerical analysis of low precision computation. Um, and that's tongue in cheek with respect to anyone's online, but I think that's the answer. Um, so. Numerical analysis is a very mature area, and it, it basically says I'm not going to divorce the theory from the implementations. It says, you know, I represent computation on a computer, so there's, it, there's no real numbers. It's all finite. Whether you have single or double or quad, it's all finite. And, I, and, I, and sometimes I just want forward errors, which is what a lot of ML does. Sometimes I just want forward errors, and that's fine for a lot of things. You know, the, the least significant digit in your bank account is not a you know, significant digit, right? I mean, the, the, the first one is, but, but not the least one. You know, be, and so database theory and a lot of CS theory is built around that least significant digit, consistency, et cetera, there, right? So um, this is a big, but numerical analysis doesn't do that. Numerical analysis, I'm going to form, formulate problems, typically because historically they came from PDEs and scientific simulations and molecular dynamics. I'm going to formulate problems 
um, such that in addition to the forward error, I get some sort of backward error. So I can say something about how my answer would be perturbed by that. So um, you know, in the 80s, you got the IEEE floating point standard. You got BLAST and IPA. You get a bunch of stuff that basically means that if you don't want to think about it, you can ignore it, because they did it. And so everyone uses it. Now you've seen a big shift driven by GPUs and ML to say you hit a memory wall, you know, changes in hardware and more so. And you know, why go single, double, quad? Why don't you go single, half, quarter? So FP16, FP8, you know, there's a complicated space there. In some cases, you lose dynamic range. But of course, if you always normalize things to be in a smaller range, you, you can do that. In, in, in other cases, you can keep the dynamic range, but you lose granularity inside the range. And so I think there's a real need for principled numerical analysis. And an obvious way to do that, actually, I mentioned some stuff on randomized linear algebra early on, is to use randomized linear algebra techniques, to, essentially because stochastic rounding can be implemented in, in hardware. And, so, and, and that will give you in sort of an implicit statistical regularization. So use these sort of techniques to build out a, a if you want to call it a principled numerical analysis, for low precision computation driven by AI ML, not, driven by, not high precision driven by scientific PDEs. So um, yeah, so I mean, that, that's, that's a big open question that needs to be funded by the government, or industry will keep funding it, and, and everything will be fine. Trust us. So <laughs> this, is, this is like, I started with a preamble that was supposed to be a rant, and then I guess get asked a few questions. This is like a rant on a rant. So this, <laughs> All right, any, any other questions? All right. <clears throat> OK, so there's a bunch of interesting random matrices. So grab me offline. I'll be around today. We can talk about that. Um, this is a great slide. I love this because it took me actually, why are you doing the steel just transforming? So it took me a while to figure out what's going on and how it fit into things. And um, I think there's a lot. Don't, don't think the 100 pages that we're going to release whenever we get it out is going to solve this. this. This frames the problem. But I mean, the right way to do this for a range of problems, the heavy tail. I mean, I think this is sort of a plan for what, you know, the types of techniques you could do in random matrix that, that are one, interesting technically, mathematically, et cetera, um, but two, we'll, we'll talk to applications, a wide range of applications, in particular AI and ML and neural networks, but more, more broadly. So, um, yeah. All right. <clears throat> so I want to give you an example of some theory <coughs> that has connections with random matrix theory under the hood, addresses the same questions you're asking, but isn't exactly this. Um, and I'll point out a few spots where there's connections also. All right, so <clears throat> still neural networks. And in a lot of these machine learning models, so think least squares. There's not a blackboard. So least squares, least squares is a funny problem because it's really taxonomized into three different things, over-constrained, square, and under-constrained. And I think, um, I think universities do a disservice by Th treating square and over-constrained as very different and treating under-constrained not at all, right? Because if you think about the, the similarities and the trade-offs there, there's a very interesting space. And um, it's very relevant for a lot of you know, these big, complicated models. Um, there's a few things that don't port, but a wide range of stuff does. And, and relevant to this, the leading order thing is that for a lot of these state-of-the-art models, there's more parameters than data. It's actually hard to quantify what precisely that means if you don't do naive parameter counting. But think of it like least squares in the under-parameterized case. And the usual th answer is you can't do that or do L1. Right, so what are you going to do? All right, so <clears throat> what we want to do is, is select models, model selection. Um, and there's probably not going to be time to get to the ensembling, but you can deal with that. And there's a bunch of subtleties there. How do I do full page right there? All right. <clears throat> so this um, grew out of a background. <clears throat> Why don't we? start by looking at the data. OK, so we looked at the data. I gave you a preamble what the data looked like. And um, you don't have to trust me, but did I say you could pip install Weight Watcher? One of the things we did when we looked at the data is to say, how can we understand model quality? And um, model quality meaning self-reported model quality. I release data. I say, go to leaderboard. My number's the best, of course, because there's a selection bias. I publish it. And so here's how well I do. So you could take that, you could do a retrospective analysis on that, and you could say, how does that correlate with any of a wide range of metrics? It could be correlate if, if the structure of the theory is uncoupled from what's going on. You could try and start to get to causal claims, and the Weight Watcher stuff I did that starts to do that because we're trying to ask falsifiable questions. So it's causal, not in the causal graph model, but in the sense that scientific scientists are making sort of predictive claims. 
So the short answer here is that you can look at scale metrics, the tracy widom edge, any of, you know, largest eigenvalue, any of a range of things having to do with the size of something. You can look at shape metrics. Think of this as a, I have a heavy-tailed eigenvalue distribution, and I want to look at the shape of that distribution, maybe the power law parameter of that distribution. So think of the largest eigenvalues versus the shape of the whole spectrum. Of course, the largest eigenvalues are spectral norm. It could be the Frobenius norm. That's a different notion of size, a different notion of scale. Um, and there could be other shape metrics. So shape and scale. And um, I don't know which is which. Um, I, I think blue is shape, red is scale. And um, the first one is correlation with model quality. self-reported model quality. Second one is correlation with generalization error. They're completely the opposite. So if you have theory that makes claims about generalization error, <clears throat> the data on the ground say it's totally different than model quality. That's not good or bad. It's just a fact. All right, so we can argue about the details. But self-reported model quality really doesn't have anything to say about generalization error. Now, if you're in a regime, you know, a, a uh, law of large numbers regime where you go to some limit and you overkill and you do this and you do that and you get a bounding theorem, yeah, they're going to be the same. But that's only because you've eaten log factors and you've gone to an overly conservative limit and the bound is so, so weak that it's not predictive. So if, if you get finer grained in this proportional limit, um, they just anti-correlate. All right. <clears throat> so we want to get theory. So this is not going to be the random matrix theory. This will be other stuff, but same, same plan. We want to get theory that ML people will be able to grok, right? Not this perturbative expansion that you need degrees in statistical mechanics, something that you can frame as a theorem for statistical learning theory, or theoretical computer science, a random matrix theory, something like this, motivated by these observations. All right, so there's a theorem in this paper. The theorem says we can get good generalization bounds using lower tail exponents and stochastic optimizers, meaning don't look at the top part of the spectrum, look at the lower part. Everyone likes the top part because it's easier to compute. The lower part, think of a Markov transition kernel, has to do with the details of how I go from here to here. And it might be believable if you know random matrix theory and you take a resolvent, in, which is an inverse, that the details of what's going on, or think of a Green's function maybe even more than, than, a, than or just a resolvent itself, the details of what's going on here, you can get a lot of insight by looking at the inverse and going to the complex plane. So we looked at the lower tail exponent. Great theorem. Actually, I like it. So if you want a theorem, this is good. So if you want to, say, is the, is the results under the hood in this theorem really good to predict? Um, and the answer is no. They really didn't correlate particularly well with, with these applications. And so what we want is a general sort of theoretical framework um, to understand these questions. So you could go to pack bounds. Those are really inadequate. Mutual information likely isn't. Pack bays is, is <laughs> maybe reasonable, but, but sort of hard for a range of technical ways. So what might be a general way to have a theory here theory in the theorem sense of the word, that ML people grok, that, that makes fine-grained predictions about model quality, about it, these sort of things. And so um, the particular way we'll talk about it here is something um, having to model selection, but the ideas will be held more generally. All right, so what's going on? Parameterized models, I have a model class theta. N is the number of samples, M is the number of outputs, D is the number of parameters. So we're doing the least squares thing, two parameters, but we may have an intermediate layer or whatever, and so there might be other stuff going on. So we're going to have three parameters. And we, you know, in general, may want to be um, in the proportional limit. So we're going to be underparameterized if d is less than something, and overparameterized if d is more than something. All right. <clears throat> um, it's actually hard. People say these things are overparameterized. It's actually hard to answer that because there's so many knobs. There's an effective degrees of freedom. There's et cetera, et cetera. But um, let's take it as that the most performant models. There's exceptions, but typically probably overparameterized in a meaningful sense of the word. And, and they basically have zero training error. All right, so I do least squares. I have more data than constraints. I can't fit the data. There's some you know, residual sum of squares. Call it good, right? When you're overparameterized in the least squares case, you can drive the training error to zero. And so people say, you can't do that. Go home. So what do you do in that case? So one solution popular in biology and genetics, is to do lasso on L1. This was popular years ago. Another solution, which surprisingly, I mean, people haven't thought so much about, um, but it's coming to the surface now in light of these things, is to look at um, the more penrose pseudo-inverse. So if you take the more penrose pseudo-inverse, that's the unique inverse that satisfies a bunch of conditions. If you think of the matrix A as U sigma V transpose the SVD, 
it is V sigma inverse U transpose, where sigma inverse means take the non-zeros and invert them and keep the zero, zero. So ignore stuff that's not in the span. Um, this solves the least squares problem when you're tall. When you're not tall, you're overdetermined. It's the minimum norm solution among all interpolants. So it gracefully goes between the overdetermined and the square and the underdetermined case. All right. <clears throat> so bias variance trade-off. Um, in, in many senses of the words, these state-of-the-art overparameterized models perform well. In some ways, they don't. But it's not totally insane like you'd see in a textbook example of fitting a you know, third-degree polynomial to one data point. So something's going on in terms of capacity control and bias variance trade-off. Um, historically, statisticians have used AIB, AIC, and BIC. These are information criteria that help guide model selection but can be used for a range of other things. If you've seen these information criteria, we're going to be doing something like this for the interpolating regime. If you haven't, um, this is sort of a design principle that allows you to, to make model decisions. And, and um, it, it's theoretical, but you know, it's, it's sort of loosely coupled with practice. And, and so people use heuristic variants of it in, in practice oftentimes. So um, I like this slide and the next one because um, HTF said, this is in 2000 when everyone was doing L1 in particular them, but everyone's doing L1. Interpolating models are unlikely to be predictive sort of of anything, I guess. Um, so H, T, F. So we have H, different T if you know that, but related T, no pun intended actually, and an M and an R that says, you know, geez, there's surprises, you know, when you, okay. So the surprises arose from work on this double descent which was popularized in machine learning by Meek Shabelkin and so on, but was well known in the 1990s in the statistical mechanics of learning, exactly as plots were there. But to do that, you need to know statistical mechanics. And the theory was not theory ML people could grok. And so it was reinvented, and people glommed onto it. And it was funny, because um, if you think about the structure of what's going on under the hood in the theory, and you, and you give meaning to the model, the stuff from the 90s made perfect sense. Essentially, it's a heat capacity. It's a, it's a fluctuate. It's a second logarithm derivative of statistical mechanics. But that's not a natural thing for ML people to think about when they fiddle with hyperparameters and knobs and so on. And so it's more natural for them to formulate the results in other ways, in which case that sort of is, is a little bit hidden. So there's a whole slew of papers. Um, and, and this basically says, if you look at the quality of the model, bias variance trade-off, you get this U shape. You interpolate. And then you overparameterize, take the minimum norm solution, do more pen rows or whatever, and you get better and better and better. And in many cases, the best here is better than the best there. So what is the double descent? The double descent is if you do generalization error in a very narrow context in machine learning, et cetera, you get this plot. Um, but really, it's not that. It's, it's about shape parameters, not scale parameters, shape parameters and volume forms. You see this, if you look at eigenvalues in random matrix theory, as a function of the aspect ratio of the matrix. When you go through a square matrix, you see this. You see this in statistical mechanics in all places. We had a paper, um, am I mixing up two stories? I don't think so. We had a paper that, um, this gives you a sense of the variance in machine learning re re review process, that we submitted to ICML. It was rejected because a reviewer savaged us and said, that's not double descent. Double descent is this very narrow thing, et cetera. Six months later, it won the best paper award at NeurIPS and basically said that um, you know, there's a bunch of stuff going on in this linear algebraic column subset selection thing. The core of it is this volume structure, and you get all this stuff here, much tighter theory, et cetera, et cetera. So this is not about generalization. This is a much more general phenomenon. So just keep that in the back of your mind. Hopefully you weren't the reviewer, but if you were, FYI. So empirically, you see this. It's very easy to hide this. If your natural control knob is just batch size or something else. You'll, batch size is, a, is something people play with sort of dabblers, but not state of the art people because of these issues about, about the memory wall. But you know, step size or whatever. It's easy to hide this. If your goal is to drive, it, it, because really there's two or three limits going on. And so if your goal is to do one thing, it, you, know, you do this, then that, and you can hide this. But if you essentially work in the, what's the proportional regime in random matrix theory, you take these two limits. You know, the, the, you know, the size, the, the width, and, and some other natural machine learning control parameter and you don't change this much more aggressively than that, which basically goes to the limit where you do this limit first, then that. This thing pops out all the time. So there's endless papers that say, see, we see it. Oh, no, it doesn't appear if you do this other thing. They're both right. If you take this limit, the people will often. You see it. If you do this other thing to try and hide it, you can hide it. So, um, so this is an empirical. This isn't a theoretical thing. All right. Large class of interpolating solutions. Much more general than least squares. 
much, much more general we'll be talking about. But think of it like the least squares case. So when you have more parameters than data, large class of solutions. <coughs> Pack bounds, which is worst case in a certain sense, worst case in a statistical, not a, you know, meaning over models, not over data like in computer science, but packed bounds are oftentimes vacuous in this regime. And the n equals go to infinity limit is not relevant, basically. You've you got to take the proportional limit, n and p, or n and some interior layer in something. And basically, there's going to be a notion of implicit regularization going on. The, the, the implicit regularization could be from the parameters, it could be from the structure of the model, which is basically what the weights are trying to capture. The weights are trying to capture a notion of implicit self-regularization, that the training process is actually doing it, because these are not sort of convex problems or anything. Okay, so in practice, the error curve can exhibit all sorts of ups and downs and lefts and rights. Most common is to have that, you know, one double cent. So most results, including that paper on surprising, and we have some, you know, most results um, rely on MSE sort of calculations at, at the end of the day. And there's no general theory that seems to be able to describe this the structure of what's going on. <clears throat> um, someone was talking about this at breakfast. Um, okay, so let me skip breakfast talk if that's the case and, and, and say, um, okay, so this sort of stuff can't arise in this large data limit. Uh, most successful predictions will arise from some Bayesian type approach and some sort of duality is going on under the hood. So we want to capture this basically. Let's see, all right, good. Um, so here's a setup. Parameterize, so pull, pull, the, um, you know, pull the chain pull, you know, when this time to get off the stage. I'll go up to whatever. And so um, I'll, I'll talk about a bunch of stuff. And then at the end, I'll, I'll try and set it up enough so it's clear where this is going. And then this is going to be the trust me. But either talk to me afterwards. But I'll, I'll, I'll give you the setup on sort of the key ideas. So parameterized models are fit using empirical risk minimization. There's an L there. And hopefully this is familiar. You can think of this as maximum likelihood estimation under the Gibbs distribution. So we're going to get into the details of these parameters. And the details of these parameters have to do with how you deal with the temperature parameter and you're in the proportional limit. So think of this as maximum likelihood under Gibbs. And there's a loss. And this is a Gibbs distribution. A Gibbs distribution means there's a chance you're in this energy band, and there's no chance you're 5x above it or 10x above it. If you're heavy chilled, there's a chance you're going to be up there. And if you run multiplicative dynamical systems processes, you're going to be up there. You're going to be heavy-tailed on gradients. You're going to be heavy-tailed on weights. You're going to be heavy-tailed on Jacobins. You're going to be heavy-tailed everywhere. So you could be up there. But that's because you're not in this linear response regime where you're a perturbative approximation of this. So we want to sort of get beyond that. All right. Interpolators. In the over-parameterized regime, the solutions are interpolators. Think of this as a hard constraint. The structure of the theory could port over to other types of hard constraints. But for right now, we want to think of the interpolation as a hard constraint. You do this first, then you do other stuff. So there really is an order of operations there. And just why? Just as a practical matter, that's what people do. So how do we uniquely identify theta star? You do some regularization. This is the generalization of the more Penrose. You can put in any of a wide range of losses there. So you, you drive some error to zero, and then you regularize in some way. And the SGD training process you know, minimizes something like a norm. Um, and there's a bunch of results that suggest that. So really, it's, you know, the more Penrose thing isn't so crazy to think about. So example of linear regression, that, that is more Penrose. SGD, it's something else. There's an expectation, you know, usual assumptions about data, et cetera. OK, so note, this is, OK, so if you know, remember one thing from the last half of the slide, it's this. Um, this is a hard constraint. Minimize this subject to this being 0. That is not the same as minimize this Lagrangian form. You may have been told that they're the same in a class. That's false, all right? They're equivalent in a very weak sense. There exists a parameter here such that if you contort and do something else, you can match those parameters there and vice versa. That's a statement about the solution objective. It's not a statement about the certificate that achieves the solution. And there's a bunch of caveats there and quantifications. As a general rule, they're just different. If you want to satisfy a hard constraint, the way to satisfy it exactly is you've got to satisfy that constraint and ignore the data. So you've got to set lambda to be 0 infinity, which means you've broken that connection. All right? If you want to sort of hand wave and approximate it and so on, it's fine. They're, they're close. They're not totally unrelated, but, but they're different. And that's going to be important for what we're doing. Why? Because if you're going to push the limits and interpolate something at scale, you might be working yourself into a hard corner case. <clears throat> so these are different. Um, hard constraints don't, so hard constraints exhibit um, soft duality, whatever, duality. Soft constraints do not. <coughs> that being said, you can go, this is a textbook, you can go, it's got to be a sort of more advanced optimization textbook, and say, geez, I can pull out something called an augmented Lagrangian duality. 
Um, if you know ADMM, they use augmented Lagrangians in our bigger setup, but this is just ADM, uh, so an augmented Lagrangian by itself, where you get R, objective, plus regularized objective, plus a bunch of other things and a bunch of regularization terms. So it's, it's a heavier duty form of regularization. And if you do this, you get augmented Lagrangian duality. And here, you really do have this duality for these hard constraints. So the reason this is relevant is because in order to interpolate the, the data, if I use soft Lagrangian duality, I got to set that regularization parameter to be zero infinity. For the hard constraint, I can set it to be you know, whatever it is, 17. And I satisfy the constraint exactly. So then I can ask, well, what if it's 17.1 or 16.9, which gets to the well-posedness. Now I can make a statement about how well-posed this is. If I relax zero, you might say, well, 0.1 is not so far from zero. But that's like saying 10 is not so far from infinity. Right? So you can easily have a singular perturbation there. And that, that, that basically splits, you know, disconnects the, you know, the, the prediction from the structure of the theory. All right. Um, any overparameterized model with a regularizer R has a corresponding dual underparameterized model. So, so basically, um, the way, so, so, so the idea of duality will hold in this hard sense with these subtleties. So any overparameterized model with a regularizer R has a corresponding dual underparameterized model. So if empiric, so if you want to go Bayes, so there's an optimization question here, and there's a, there's a um, sort of a statistical Bayesian question. So empirical risk minimization is the maximum estimation under the Gibbs distribution. You can encode the regularizer as a prior. The regularizer is a log prior. So now you're going to have two temperature parameters. If you think of this as a Lagrange or a price or a temperature parameter, now to encode the constraint R, not just the loss, the constraint, you're going to have a second temperature parameter. The interpolator maximizes the prior over this. So you have two parameters, and you've got to set this one to zero first before that. And in the theory, this one has to converge to zero faster than that. So you have two temperatures. There's a posterior distribution to concentrate around interpolators. You send this to zero, and then you send that to zero. You can do the opposite. You just get something different. You can do them at the same rate, but you get something different. Um, so we can measure the uh, error by examining the posterior in this limit. Um, you can use marginal likelihood. It's a good measure of model quality. It has connections to cross-validations and pack bays and a bunch of other things. Um, you can use a marginal likelihood with Laplace's method. This is how you get information criteria in the tall case, in the, in the over-constrained least. I mean, it's much more generally squares, but in, this fails in the, in the over-parameterized regime. Um, so the main sort of theoretic result is that you can establish a duality. You've got to use a co-area formula, go from the, the over-parameterized to the under-parameterized, a bunch of stuff from um, sort of uh, geometric measure theory where um, you can say that there's an underparameterized dual model with the same marginal likelihood, the same volume form. So you'd expect that you get something funny because it's, it's the same volume form. Under some, these are actually very modest sort of regularity conditions. There's a key technical result. It's a co-area formula. Um, so hand wave -wave -wave level, you can swap sample size D and model size, but there's a bunch of subtleties, and you've got to do it right. If you're, careful, if you're not careful about any one of those steps, the two temperatures, the order of limits, the, you get you know, who knows what. All right. What if you apply the same technique to derive B of C, a du dual model? You'll get an information criteria where, if you're familiar with the information criteria, this is something you'll see. If you're not, this IIC is going to have a couple terms, IIC. The IIC, this information criteria for the interpolating regime that we derived that way, has a log regularizer, has a sharpness, has a curvature. And the point of this is that if you go into the machine learning literature, there's 10 papers saying we should regularize this way. There's 20 papers saying we should do this. And there's 30 papers, yeah, maybe at a, at a zero, because these slides are a year old. There's 100 papers, you know, 200. So these things correspond very naturally. Sharpness. Do you look at the top eigenvalues, or the trace, or the top 10, you know, or the bottom 10? I mean, there's a bunch of papers that do this. So this really is something about the sharpness. This is a volume form, which is different than what we were talking about before in random matrix theory. But under the hood, there's a bunch of connections that it wasn't formulated in this paper, but um, or, or, you, know, you, can, you can think about extending. And a bunch of curvature. This is really sort of a fundamentally high dimensional thing, is that the, the thing that we have sort of the least intuitive control on. And here's your information criteria. So boom, it's sort of on the nose. Um, OK, so a bunch of uses of the IIC, model selection, pack based bounds, if you like bounds, improvements from ensembling, basis for the HTSRs, the weight stuff I was talking about before. Um, qu un quantify uncertainty. A lot of people, scientists want to quantify uncertainty. It all breaks down in this regime, 100%. How do you quantify uncertainty in this regime? Regression diagnostics and neural network models. And I'm out of time, so I'm not going to be able to tell you about that. But if you're interested in ensembling in this regime, 
Ensembling is something that people use a lot. Most of the intuition is driven by the over, over uh, whatever, under you know, the overdetermined least squares or random forests. Random forests are things that can't go into that overparameterized regime. Back to the quote from the HTF book, right? Um, how do you do uncertainty quantification and ensembling in this regime? So if I had two hours, I could tell you, but I'm out of time, so grab me at the coffee break. <clears throat> And grab my bonus. <laughs> action, you can. Okay, then let's thank right. you again and you can.